There's a lot of battles in this movie with many different villains. We have these really extraordinary action sequences that feel like you would imagine the comic book would be if it came to life. In the previous films, we saw a lot of Spider-Man battling, but we always lost the main character that we loved, Peter Parker. So I felt it was important in this third film, like in the comic books that I've read, to have Peter be involved in the battles, maybe caught at some moment when he wasn't in his Spidey suit. This is the biggest roller coaster ride. In movie two, we had this great train scene. We thought the train sequence, you know, was just the hugest thing anybody would ever do. But now, we, of course, we have to top that. These pictures are made with the help of very good second unit directors and a great stunt coordinator, Scott Rogers, who really rigged up all these stunts. That's been an immense help. And those guys, they're like, they're scientists over there with their stunts. I mean, they've got their go camera system, which for the first time, they are flying a actor in conjunction with flying the camera. You know, Dan and I like to, you know, find the edge of what's currently possible. What we thought was the edge a long time ago, we're beyond that now. We literally sit down and on a weekly basis put together rigs that I've never seen. And you know, that's the challenge, is that we're constantly on the very cutting edge of stunts and stunt technology just trying to, uh, you know, impress ourselves. My responsibility, along with Dan Bradley, is to basically organize and coordinate the stunt team and uh, help design the way we're going to do certain stunts. It's a wholly encompassing occupation. It tests your physical abilities, your mental abilities to figure out how to do things and, you know, frankly, your emotional battle with fear. The stunts on Spider-Man are, are a little more unique because, you know, because of the superhero nature and everything's stronger and more powerful. And your limits of reality or so far beyond, you know, a traditional movie. What is very exciting to watch are these characters interacting in a different way, watching Toby perform Spider-Man feats as Peter Parker. Toby did a lot of stunts in this picture. In this way, we could always see this great actor's face, Toby Maguire, and be in the midst of these battles. And that would give it a different flavor. At the end of the day, you still want to be with Toby's face. You want to be with Peter Parker as he's experiencing these events, as he's going through these battles. I'm out there quite a bit. You know, we're always trying to take uh, Spidey's mask off. And I just think if you disconnect for too long by putting masks on these characters, that, that it, it kind of hurts the connection. You know, it hurts, it hurts the moviegoer's experience. This is my third picture with Toby. It's sort of like, you know, the old pro comes back in and he's doing some great stuff. And James and, and he really, you know, got to it. They did virtually all their own stuff. In this movie, we're really fulfilling a goal that Sam had from the very beginning of the, of the series to have more action take place high above the street. So there's a big chase fight sequence, but it's Peter as Peter and Harry up in the sky. This particular battle that takes place between James Franco and Peter Parker is really the story of friends turned against one another. It really isn't the story of the new Goblin versus Spider-Man, so I thought it most appropriate that we could see their faces. There's a great kind of air joust, and uh, since the first one, you know, Sam is, and everyone is really um, advanced with, with the, the aerial uh, photography and everything, so just they were ready for a real, real air battle like they hadn't done before. James is, um, you know, really athletic, really controlled and aware and, and fantastic in a fight scene. The big challenge is, you know, there's so much of the work is aerial, and, you know, Sam wanted to take the masks off. So suddenly we're dealing with, you know, very complicated, very tough aerial shots where, you know, we're seeing the actors. In order to do most of those things, you need wires to do it. So, you know, 90% of the stunts on Spider-Man, you know, incorporate a wire of some sort. The more we shot, the more I got really excited about actually really using Toby 
and using Toby's face and the real actor instead of CG. And what's interesting is that I worked closer with the stunt people on this show than I did on the last show. And they actually made huge improvements and they, they set up almost a, a motion control system for their stunt people in terms of they had wires that were computer controlled. We've uh, developed a, you know, a flying system, the computer controlled winches, and we're doing things that have never been done before. It gave us the ability to, to not just fly a body through a space, but to manipulate it at the same time. We have up to 10 high powered winches that you know, we can attach to people and, and work up to 60 different axes. And you know, very often we'll have three or four winches you know, attached to one performer to you know, move them at great velocity through any space. All the winch does is take line in and let line out. What's special about these is that they take them into a really strict uh, precision level, decimals of an inch, if we want to set, you know, to go that close. And they all talk to one another, so if you have multiple devices working in a gag and one, for some reason, might be out of position, the other one knows it's out of position and they'll either compensate or they'll shut themselves down, uh, you know, so you avoid a collision or something of that nature. When we're doing wire work and things, every human being on Earth will fly slightly differently, so it's like, you know, what you may envision and actually rehearse with a stuntman or a stunt double will change when you hook up the actor sometimes. We go through a, you know, a discovery process. We, we figure it out from an engineering point of view. We put it in, we work it, we make changes, and then we lock a profile uh, that works for that particular shot. Tonight's the night of the big explosion. We're doing a bunch of uh, wire camera work and we're doing some stunt work here. Peter's thrown a, a razor bat back towards Terry and it explodes, so we're gonna do a huge practical explosion. Harry's gonna come flying through that fireball, partly on fire himself, just straight towards camera. I mean, Dan Bradley and Scott Rogers, the stunt, the stunt team guys, they know how to make this safe, so they're gonna, they're gonna make sure it's safe for the stunt guy, fly him through. And in the end, we'll probably have to do a face replacement, put James Franco's face on there, because realistically, he couldn't, he couldn't do that stunt. Today, we're on stage 29 at Sony, shooting a fireball element with a stunt guy going through it that we were gonna be shooting in downtown LA, but we kinda of ran out of time before they let us shoot before midnight there. So we decided to pick it up on stage. Would have rather had it on location, but this shooting on stage gives us a little bit more flexibility. We have more time to get extra bonus elements. Peter Goblin fight, you know, Peter's 65 feet up in the air on the side of a building, he's clothesline Harry off the board and he realizes he's, thinks he's just killed his friend. You know, we do a live shot of the double, 65 feet in the air, he, in which, you know, it looks like he leaps off the ground, free falls, and then right before he hits the ground, he webs up and slows down and lands in a, in a pose. Just to do that drop, we use three winches that translates his weight so he actually alters the way he's hanging from and and you know we hit free fall so all the clothes and everything and it drops right to the ground. Three, two, one, go! You know even Toby as soon as we shot it he looked at me and he goes that may be the best stunt in the, all these movies. Well, we're downtown, uh, supposed to be New York. The uh, Sandman goes into the sand truck that has, you know, yards of sand, gathers it all up and blows out of it and heads down the street as a giant sandstorm and taking with it people and cars and all kinds of objects. So this shot will have the stuntman flying away from the camera and then the camera moves down the street and follows the action as the cars blow and the people run. And it's a timing issue. Everything has to hit on an exact mark and an exact time so each car reacts right after the other. Grant's the uh, the guard in the back of the uh, 
the armored car. And uh, the guard gets, uh, he's the one that catches the brunt of the Sandman's wrath. And uh, so he, he kind of, you know, gets hammered down in the fist and hits the ground and then he, he gets buried in sand for a little while. I think I just soiled myself. Um, I was staying there and a 600 pound sand fist came crashing through the roof and uh, I dived out of the way just in time, thank goodness. I didn't know it was gonna come that low. That was a little scary, but uh, the sound, there's not much acting in there. The sound really, you're jumping out of the way naturally. Grant, uh, well, I think he was perfectly cast. He's an armored car guard and you know, his job is to you know, guard the money. And being a producer, he's uniquely qualified for guarding the money. So Sam has typecast him and invited him to uh, spend a lot of time on the unit getting buried underneath tons of sand. Do just, you know, does it, on his box, do this, come here, and, and just let yourself you know, kind of fling across frame. Yeah. We're here on stage 24, getting ready to do another stunt. I've got a harness on, it's a little tight. It's meant to be tight and snug, but when you're already a little nervous and it's already a little bit tighter, it just, Makes it that much more difficult, but it's all safety. Grant's great. I mean, he has a great attitude. He literally got buried in, you know, sand. So, you know, that's a little unnerving at some point. The sand is actually ground up corn they're gonna dump on me. Uh, I think there's 3,000 pounds worth, but we'll see. We'll see. Piece of cake. <laughs> It wasn't bad until that you felt the pressure going up and still trying to scream as there's all the dust was in the air and just waiting for it to overtake your head. All I really had to do was stand up, but it, I think it was 3,000 pounds that dumped on it. And after a while, it, it's a little difficult to push out. I think next to our superhero, he's probably the one that gets beat up the most in the film. She doesn't know what you are. Peter, she knows me very well. And when she kissed me, it was just like she used to kiss me. That taste. Strawberries. The fight between Harry and I in the Osborne mansion is a great fight because it's two guys who love each other like brothers with a lot of history of hurting each other and um, it gets pretty nasty. So you take two superpowers, and but they're still friends, and their emotions are raw. And it, uh, I think they were trying to get, you know, away from the big fantastic, which is the majority of the other film. And this was uh, a different sequence on another level, and almost more personable, more real, and just grittier. We actually developed the style with the actors, and really talking about it on an emotional level. And, you know, Toby would uh, respond and go, you know, I think my character would do this. I don't think my character would do that. And James is the same way. So it's like, sort of really hand in hand, we came upon the choreography that felt real and true to these characters. <laughs> An A-ramp's actually a very old piece of equipment. You know, you step on it, throws you through the air. So we see uh, when Peter throws Harry, the double got, you know, steps on it, goes flying through the air. So you see him and he hits a, hits a balcony and goes flipping over. And so we cut the floor out and filled it with a foam. And, you know, and he hits himself in endos and does a three quarter. And if the floor was there, he would have landed on his head cut the floor away, put the pad there, and you know, he enables the stuntman to actually land on his head and not get hurt. Ready and action. We're here in Culver City uh, at Sony Studios on stage 30, shooting some work on our motion base today. Ready and action. Basically, we can put our taxi there and, and maneuver it about 22 degrees in any direction so we can, in a safe environment, be able to have actress in the car, manipulating it in all kinds of ways that we couldn't do on the street. 
If ever we need to have the taxi at more than a 22 degree angle, we actually can go on this. Basically, it can go 360 degrees, depending on how and where the, the car is rigged. Uh, and like, as I said, it does actually go 360 degrees, and our, uh, our fearless MJ tested that rig out herself. Ready and action. It wasn't really scary, it was more nauseating is when they turned the, the taxi around. Like, it was okay going forward, but the reset was like your stomach just fell, you know, to your throat, and that was not fun. She's a trooper. She's doing all, a lot of this stunt work, things that we could do with a stunt double. She's, she's been doing them all and doing a great job. One of the best stunts that I think we did in the uh, final battle is, is when Harry comes in and he hits Venom and Venom goes flying through the walls and we did all in one shot. We used two Venoms, which is the beauty of having <laughs> that suit, is uh, we fly him through and we rotate him as he hits this one thing and this breakaway table or, or a rack and he flips up and he smashes into this wall face first and then as we pan with him, Another venom that's hidden just behind the wall blasts out of the wall, you know, doing what we call a twisty ratchet, which is a single line, flipping him, landing him on the ground, and rolls him out. Three, two, one, go! Getting a great shot is a result of doing our homework and, and planning it well and executing it well, but there isn't a shot you know, out there worth getting anybody hurt over. I have tremendous amount of trust in our stunt team and have to because really if somebody makes the wrong kind of mistake, I, I, I could die. I mean, really, I'm not saying that I ever feel like I'm in that kind of jeopardy, but if, if somebody did the wrong thing, it is a possibility. It's, it's weird though sometimes when you're on a harness and you're 50 feet above the ground and you're like, wow, like if if somehow this, this computer-operated machine had some kind of weird glitch and decided to drop me, that would be really a disaster, you know? The most important part is, is obviously safety, but without compromising safety to bring a level of uh, intensity. You know, I want them to know that they're safe, but I also kind of want them to not feel like they're safe necessarily, because as a director, I'd like to go ahead and capture that energy. And. You know, we're always trying, I think, out of, you know, ego or anything else, we're always trying to better ourselves, you know, and, and take it the next step. You know, we never like to repeat ourselves. We, we are always pushing for something we've never seen before. To meet the level of audience expectation, you need to shake it up and break it up to bring about these fantastic sights to thrill the audience. I get to tell people to do all the things I dreamed about when I was seven years old. It's like, you know, I love car crashes. I love watching fights and movies, and it's like, now I'm doing it. There were shots that I set up, I did when I was, you know, 10 with my Matchbox cars. And now they're, <laughs> they're real-sized cars, and the cops are holding traffic for me. It's fantastic. Yeah.